seems like every week we're hearing across the country. Um, is officer murders on the rise, or has no, it, we're no, just they're hearing more? No, they're on the way down. Okay. There's fewer killed this year than have been in the past, but um, it's always a tragedy when you lose one. I, I think nowadays, too, when, when an officer is killed, you hear about it more. It makes more mainstream press than it did in the past. Yeah. There's a, a, something started here a little while ago called the Thin Blue Line. It's a takeoff an American flag, black and gray, with gray stars. And there's a thin blue stripe down the middle of the flag. Principle being the thin blue line between the good guys and the bad guys. And uh, it's always been there. The, the line's always been there. Law enforcement's always been on the wall between the good people and the bad people. That's what it is. We take casualties on that wall. We always have. Larry and I spent a lifetime on that wall. We both go back tomorrow. But it's a young man's game, and we are no longer young. We have time for two more questions. Daryl, do you have someone with a question? Yep. Yeah, I, uh, it's always been my impression that violent, impulsive crimes are committed by people with limited intellectual resources for the most part. But can you think of a case where you were up against a, an intelligent, well-planned crime that you either solved or, or didn't, weren't unable to There are intelligent people that commit crimes. There are very few people that put together a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> the reason being, it's not something they do every day. They're not professional hitmen. Right? And I would do an interrogation of somebody that's a college graduate, for example, and say, you know, how many mistakes do you think you made? Think you made five? Think you made 10? You think you made some you don't even remember making? See, I have got nothing else to do but find them. And he watched the wheels begin to turn. The plan never works. I had a guy put together a murder plan, college graduate. His, the other participant in the crime is a college graduate from good schools. They planned it for eight months. Eight months. We unravel it in three days. And everybody is in jail. Okay? So he told his girlfriend who did the shooting that the police are stupid and they will never figure this out. And after Jennifer confessed to me for her part in, the, in killing this woman, I said, I have one last question, Jennifer. Do you think the police are stupid? She didn't answer me. So now you don't have plan plans happen in the movies. Where all the bad guys wear a nice suit and they all think about this, they're all very cold and so on. The reality isn't that way at all. They do dumb and stupid things and the plan just doesn't work out or somebody sees them that they had no idea was even around. Classic example, and Larry remembers this, the two sisters are killed in the house. They are shot to death, multiple gunshot wounds, both of them, two handguns involved. Each victim has 12 gunshot wounds. Guy reloads, you know, to kill the other one. That's a, that's incredible, right? But he didn't know, nor did we, until he knocked on the door. <coughs> that a 66-year-old lady living across the street had a minor stroke, and part of her therapy was to sit in the window and write notes about who came and who went to write down license numbers and times and so on and so on. You know. His plan blew up in his face. Because somebody sees him and somebody writes it down because their doctor told her to write it down. <laughs> That's why right. exactly right. Exactly right. And I was discussing the case the other day that that a guy planned a, a murder out, uh, mainly to collect his own life insurance policy. And uh, he, he took great steps. He wanted to hire somebody to look 
like him uh, and then kill that person and make it look like that, that it was him that to kill it. He, he went to the Gazette newspaper, put an ad in the paper, to he look in the higher people, he was an audiovisual home theater company. And, and uh, as luck would have it for him, but unfortunately for this young kid, he had just come up from Texas, answers the ad, and uh, he said, boom, this, this is the guy I'm looking for. But he had taken great steps before that to set up all these insurance policies. So he ends up killing the guy, throwing him off of a cliff in the pickup truck, sets the pickup truck on fire. And, you know, pickup trucks don't catch on fire when they go down a hill and hit a tree. They, they just don't. They don't throw on fire it's because somebody set it on fire. But this guy's burned up, and he's burned and pushed over the cliff in his truck, and he's burned to, he's just a skeleton. But it's, it's amazing that in the back of that pickup truck on the ground, about 10 feet behind that pickup truck, was the driver's license. Well, how did that get there? Well, the guy wanted to make sure that we knew that that's probably him in that truck. Uh, he, he planned it all the way up, but like I said the other day, he didn't plan on how to get away with it. How was he going to collect your choice? We have one final question.
about the show. A couple of weeks ago, they hired a sound editor, and in the entertainment world, movies, TV, whatever, a lot, of, almost all people are independent contractors. Nobody works for anybody. They work in a contract, they get a 1099, they don't withdraw, they don't hold taxes, they don't do health care, they don't do anything. You don't work for MGM unless you're making a movie. And you're not working for them the day the movie's not being made anymore. This is how it is. So Homicide Hunter needs a new sound editor. This guy sent in his resume. He lives in a two-story condo in Clearwater, Florida. The show is edited visually in New York City. But they want him to do a soundtrack for one of the episodes. So they send him the audio of the sound. Audio only, no pictures. So he starts working on it at 8 o'clock at night. He uh, works at home, and he doesn't pay attention to what time it is. Right? He's not married. And his studio gear is on the second floor, and he lives on the first floor. So he plays the audio, and it screams, followed by gunshots. <laughs> well, I didn't like it. So he plays it again, screams, followed by gunshots. And I don't like that either. And screams, followed by gunshots. This goes on a few times. Here's a really loud knock at the door. <laughs> And he looks out the window and there's four cops on his porch. There's a fifth cop going around the back and he's starting to feel his adrenaline starting to pump. You know, and he comes downstairs, he opens the door and they say, Sir, we have reported shots fired in this apartment. Keep your hands where we can see them and step back. We're coming in. And he's like, oh my God. And he's like, this is going to test back. He says, I can explain this. Oh yeah, well you better get about it. You know what I mean? And he said, I'm going to work on television and show me. And he takes this guy upstairs, and the other three fan out and then looking for bodies or wounded or whatever. <laughs> and they go upstairs, and the guy hears the auto track, and he hears my voice. And he says, that's Joe Kendall. <laughs> and the guy says, well, yeah, I'm doing a sound thing for Homicide Hunter. And he hollers down and says, hey, guys! <laughs> You guys, Homicide Hunter, come up here, it's really cool! <laughs> now they're all upstairs, they're taking selfies with this guy. He still has cerebral palsy in this particular moment, but and they're taking pictures of his equipment and everything, and then they shake his hand and they leave. And he's sitting there thinking, did that really just happen? <laughs> that was so funny. That story was shared throughout Discovery, throughout Jupiter, throughout everybody. And everybody thought that was absolutely the funniest thing they ever heard. It's true, you know. So this is kind of the last call. If anyone uh, has any questions that we haven't been able to answer for you, uh, oh, we have a lady over here. All right, stand up, stand up, stand up and be proud. I just wonder, do you use forensic artists at all? We do, we also, we did at one time, we used artists only, but now and in the digital world we have computer programs and identikit programs that assemble uh, human faces. And they do it electronically without the use of an actual physical artist. When I was uh, first started out, we had two artists that worked for the police department who drew pictures of people, and now they use computers. So the people have gone away. I
and all the helicopter guys are out of business. They got a six million dollar helicopter and it's parked in a hangar. Nobody wants to pay the fee. They buy a drone for a thousand bucks to get this in there. So technology will create you and then it will destroy you. That's the way it goes, you know. Straight in the back, Joe. This Kenda Cruz was my hubby and my 50th wedding anniversary. Oh, yeah. <laughs> officer who worked homicide, so we really relate to you and Kathy. My question is about a certain episode where you had forgotten your anniversary <laughs> and we took Kathy out to dinner at a very nice restaurant to make it up to her. In the middle of the meal, you got the phone call. Yeah. <laughs> Were you not able to occasionally make arrangements with one of your detectives to no. say, <laughs> cover for me for two hours? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any questions for Kathy or Joe? Uh, Over yes. here. We have one thing we want to do. Sandy Vernon. Sandra J. Come up, please. Vernon Lange, come up here. He's not coming. Where is he? Over here. Come over here. Get up here. Sandy was my ring bearer at my wedding. Uh, he looked I was 12 years old. Yeah. And he looked really cute in the dress, I thought. Sing my song, please. We used to serenade Kathy with a barbershop song that she thought was very cool. From a, Sandy and I have known each other for longer than 50 years. And we're good friends, and he's a great guy. And he lives in Pennsylvania, and he lives in Florida. He has a house in Florida. He lives in the winter in Pennsylvania in the summer. Do you remember the words? Huh? You want to do this or not? I'm not going to make you crazy. If you don't want to do it, we want to do it. Huh? You want to do it? I want to do it. Yeah, that's what we know, right? Yeah, I, I, I planned on interrupting you and telling you that I wanted to sing specifically for her. Well, that's what we're going to do. Yeah, I was going to ask you to join. So this is really what we're going to do. And we're set the better way around. Yeah, we're still going to do it for It's for her, it's not for you. <laughs> Like a girl that married dear old dad, she was a pearl and the only girl that he ever had. A sweet old-fashioned girl with hearts so true, one who loved nobody else but you. Oh, I want a girl just like a girl that married.
during the anniversary dinner, and he gets up and leaves. There is no way that you wouldn't get upset as a wife. There has to come a time where there's friction in the marriage. There has to, because, of you know, course. Yeah, right. So I have, is married I have so a mind shaft picked out for him. <laughs> she was home. I thought she was supposed to work that night. Kathy worked part-time and her schedule was a little bit varied because she was a float nurse. I mean, wherever somebody called off sick, she was up and plug her in. But I thought she was off that day. So I thought, I'll go home, I'll change, I'll get more clothes and we'll, everything's cool. So I come blasting through the door and she's in the kitchen. We did in a uh, uh, four-level house, so the, the entry level was on the third level, so you come in a rec room and the kitchen's like raised, you know, four or five steps up. So she's up in that kitchen, and as soon as she, I opened the door, she turned and looked. And I was like, oh, crap. You know, it just, it was like, Anybody ever watches your news, but you probably do. <laughs> so 
So maybe at the end of 30 days, you'll have learned your lesson. And I hung up on him. And for the next 30 days, I just ignored those people, walked right past them. Talked to every other one, but not them. They got the message. They never came back to my house again, and it wasn't on TV.
part of the show, is that right? Uh, well, I, no, I don't own it. I mean, I, I control it, but I don't own it. It is owned wholly by Discovery Communications and Corporate, all right? But I am paid a fee uh, by contract for my services. Uh, I have in that contract that I have absolute say on what goes on TV and what does not. My greatest concern was that it would be Hollywooded up, you know, by these idiots. And I make sure that that doesn't happen. They haven't tried to do it for several years, but I don't trust them. So I still, that's why I watch it once, to make sure it's correct. They tried it initially, and I said, hey, hey, hey. Act three, that business with the guns, it didn't happen. Well, we thought, oh, there you go, thinking again. <laughs> that is not your area. I do the thinking. You do the work. You know what I mean? So once they figured out that nothing would get past me, then they kind of gave up. So I have control of it, but I don't know. Good. All the way back at about 10 o'clock. Hi. Um, somebody had mentioned the uh, commercial a while ago. I was wondering the one about Halloween. Yes. Um, yes. I thought that was so funny. Where was that filmed? That was filmed in a private home in Los Angeles, California. Okay. Uh, with an L.A. crew, and uh, that was really funny. And it worked out well to where they, they did it, and they had to do two takes because the crew laughed when I did it. <laughs> And it was live sound. But what I did was, I took that actress that was the wife, the one who played the wife, and I had her sit down with me, and for 30 minutes I said, say the lines you're going to say over and over. I wanted to get her cadence so I could match the cadence, so I could move my lips to her cadence and have her voice come out of my mouth, right? <laughs> and I did that, and we shot it the first time, and it was perfect. But the crew left. So I had to do it a second time, but we did it in two takes, and it looked funny. I threw in the hip turn on my own. And the, guy, the guy who's the director said I had a future as a woman. I didn't know if that was good or bad, but it was the first time. So then Halloween, of course, we went and had that commercial, and I got him a big button to put on his jacket that says, this is my Halloween costume. Which was a blue shirt and the shoulder holster and all that. And Kathy wore the, you know, she wore the prisoner outfit. So we, we went to the Halloween party as a commercial. That was really funny. Though. Way in the back, you want to pop. Uh, Joe, the first question is for you. When did you decide that you might want to become a policeman? And Kathy, how did you feel about it? I had an uncle who was a Colorado State Patrol officer, and he made sergeant on the State Patrol. I always admired him. His name was Dan Morrissey. And I admired him so much, I named my son after him. My son is Dan, after his uncle Dan. My uncle Dan, his great uncle. And I always, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to do something I could control, and I wanted to do something that would probably make a difference in the world. And I decided I wanted to be a policeman. And so that's what I said about doing, and that's what I did. So at the time, he was working for his dad, which kind of wasn't working out. And so I put the two kids to bed, and this was Friday night. He came in from work and, and had a few screwdrivers. <laughs> and I said, you need to sit down. This is not working where we are now. I said, you have a year to do something else. Or else. <laughs> and he's like, uh oh. <laughs> so then we went to bed. The next morning he woke up. He said, Honey, do you remember what you said last night? And I said, Would you like chapter and verse or would you just like a synopsis of it? <laughs> and he's like, oh, shit. <laughs> and he started right then a plot. He said, I've always wanted to be a policeman. I said, I know that. Go for it. And he started applying. He applied in our the hometown that we were in then. He applied in Pittsburgh. He applied in Columbus, Ohio, which we had been in. And he applied in Colorado Springs because he always wanted to go 
where his grandparents lived, and he spent summers there. Colorado Springs came in first. So we moved, and my parents from the hometown were really pissed. And I took the grandbabies and moved to Colorado. Hard left, all the way over here, Joe Kathy, hard left. Kathy, I remember, I think I remember from last year that you were saying you weren't really interested in being on television, and yet I saw this year that you were a guest at the Broadmoor Hotel. And, and I wonder if you have more appearances coming up because you were fabulous. Well, I wanted to be in the, that was the hundredth show, so that puts the series into syndication. Wanted to be in that show. Um, according to Discovery and Jupiter, they are going to interview me again this year for one of the shows. I don't know what it's about. And they also want to interview the kids if they agree to it. And both of my kids have agreed to be interviewed. That's now, whether, whether they do that for real and whether they put it into a show, we don't know yet. We, but we're pretty sure they were, are going to do it. The one o'clock, uh, Joe Kathy. OK, for Kathy. Um, what was the difference between you and Joe when your kids started dating? How did you react to where Joe reacted? <laughs> I, mean, I, don't really, I don't really know. Most, you know, most, my kids had pretty level heads, and they kind of dated in groups. And they had, you know, so there wasn't a boyfriend-girlfriend. They had a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And every once in a while, he didn't approve of the boyfriend. <laughs> and, and the big thing back then was Dungeons and Dragons. OK, so they would, she would bring a whole crew to our house to play Dungeons and Dragons, you know, and everything. And, I, and some of them were like, Whoa. and so I would say, I said, shut up. <laughs> They're here, they're drinking sodas and chips, and they're playing Dungeons and Dragons. Keep your big mouth shut. And then one of them who was, he was 21, I think, yeah, because he could drink. He was 21, and he, took, he asked my daughter to her senior prom. And uh, he said, don't worry, Mrs. Kendall. He said, well, we're going to do that. He said, then we're going to go out and have something to eat, and then we're going to, you know, I'll bring her home, have her home before 1 o'clock in the morning. I said, fine. Then Joe was a you know the guy, don't worry about it. I think he's fine. Now, the, my son had, we called them the five Bs, because there were four friends that they had been friends from grade school. So if they dated, they were all together. So we, don't, we didn't really worry about him so much. Joe, Kathy, right here at the rail, right here to your left. Towards here. This question is for Kathy. Um, since the show or show pretended to be a doctor, did you ever have a band from the hospital? Yes. So I wanted to He wasn't banned from the hospital. He was banned from looking at charts, which is totally illegal. Yeah, I was in. You're not allowed to do that. You gotta remember, I never said I was a doctor. They said I was a doctor. They said, they said good morning, doctor. My response was, good morning. I didn't correct them. You act like you belong, you belong. I draw it up here. I'll crawl for you. I'm not quite sure, quite sure that. But I just want to let you know that uh, we both got an email from Eric Stern again, which happens every time we're on this cruise. But last week's episode was the highest rated episode we've ever had. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah, so. No, I, I, I'm 
I'm going to try to figure out a way to remotely turn my phone on tomorrow. <laughs> I'm afraid it might explode and I'm going to... But the funny part about that is all three Kenna Cruises, that's been the episode. We've been on the ship when we've got that notification all three times, which means they need to go on a lot more cruises. <laughs> Makes sense to me. Makes sense to me. Thanks, Carl. I didn't know that. Kathy, you know, over here on the left again. Does anyone talk about the Halloween uh, commercial? What about the Jumanji commercial? Did you have fun making that? Did I? Oh, I had a ball. That was really a lot of fun. Yeah, I really loved it. Yeah, it was, it was, and Kathy liked it because you got to play with all the animals. They have an animal trainer here. He brought scorpions and roaches and two twenty foot snakes. And, you know. I had a pepper roach in my hand. That's crawling around my hand. So this is the size of my hand, and he was this big. Oh. He's a pepper roach. And then the black scorpion, a dictator scorpion, was little. Yep. He was this big too. And he's running around my hand. The, the animal trainer said, the Kelly said, well, you know, can, this, you know, can the scorpion sing me? Oh yeah, but he's cool. <laughs> How do you know a scorpion is cool? Did he, like, send you a note this morning? Dear captor, I'm having a nice day. <laughs> what? Yeah, she didn't care, she's playing with him anyway. I didn't get to play with the snake, though. I was upset because I didn't get to play with the snake. <laughs> Circumstances. Do you find that uh, medical or people coming into the hospital with medical conditions tend to lie like murder suspects? Where they, oh yeah, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I wasn't on that foot, uh, you know, I don't know what's the matter kind of stuff? Yeah. Usually, by well, the time I got them, they were too sick to talk half the time. <laughs> you know, they were like, ugh, ugh, ugh. that's what you got. Uh, you know. I dealt with a lot of other ones, and it depended on where I was working. I told you that I was a float nurse. Well, if I was working in medical or surgical, they were pretty sick. But if I was working in mother baby, they were pretty happy, you know? You know, or she was going, ooh, you know? But that turned out well. So it kind of depended. Kathy wore a t-shirt from the movie Gone with the Wind when she worked in Mother Baby and said, I don't know nothing about birth and no baby. <laughs> that always impressed the patients. <laughs> Oh, he said, I don't want to say anything. He said, but I was a 
wasn't sure because they hadn't said it. I said, no, he just called me and said it wasn't, had said it wasn't him. But it was really nice and that, it was really nice that he was, had my back, you know, in case it was him. Did I need anything? But I have a question for Joe. The commercial, the barbecue commercial, mm -hmm. where was that done? In a backyard in uh, Maryland, uh, a little ways from Baltimore, north, uh, northwest of Baltimore, private home. They leased it from a guy to use to make the commercial because he had a big back deck and a big yard, which is what they wanted, you know, a big back deck and yard. So we had a whole bunch of people there at that deal, you know. So that was fun too, the barbecue commercial. Yeah. I was in that commercial too. She's actually appeared in uh, three or four shows now, and she was interviewed once in one program about being married to me. I told her to be sure and lie, or they would cancel the program. Um, but she was interviewed uh, about our marriage on one particular show. It was a couple of years ago. She got her full Hollywood work paint on, and you know, did the whole thing. So. Yeah. I love your stories, and it would be fun to get yet another perspective. Is there any possibility that one or both of your children would join us on a future cruise? And my son, my son says, he's a commander in the Navy. He says, Dad, they pay me to go to sea. I don't pay them. <laughs> He has sailed in six of the seven seas in 25 years in the Navy, so no, he's not interested in a cruise. It's highly unlikely that he would ever come. He's used to haze gray and jets landing on his head, you know, and a kind of carrier deck, so, you know, probably not, you know. My daughter is a uh, uh, GS-14 Global Strike Command at Barksdale in Louisiana, and uh, she works like a dog. She's a logistics officer for them. And uh, she has very little time to do anything. They're in control of the nuclear weapons in the United States, so they're busy people. I don't think that they would, you know, I don't think. Although I didn't think that interview for the show, but they said they will. I was surprised by that. I was surprised mostly by my daughter, who's kind of secretive, you know, but she said, I'll do that. You will? <laughs> we'll see if they do it, I don't know. Before we do anything else, I would like to thank all of the people that brought us gifts and books and all kinds of stuff, the coins that mean so much to Joe, the bracelets, you know, the jewelry, just everything. It's so nice of you to do that, and we so appreciate it. And we just love having a big old happy family that gets together once a year. I think it's great. <laughs> I'll make this fast. The first book is fabulous. I devoured it. I bet how are sales going for it, and what about the second? Well, the sales are, they went to second printing nine days in. So the sales are going quite well. They're going, they're going quite well. It's, uh, every book signing I went to, uh, there were 500 people waiting to get their books signed. One time it was 700 people over there at 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the, 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 the people stayed, the people at Barnes & Noble, they said, no, we'll stay. Oh, so why? So the last guy in line said, I really appreciate it. It was 1.15 or something. He said, I really appreciate you, you, you staying here. I said, hey, you stayed, didn't you? <laughs> why shouldn't I? So but anyway, we're discussing a second book right now.
So apparently, apparently the answer is no. <laughs> uh, it, when they do footage, I mean, they're, they try to be economical. It's expensive to shoot television. And they try to be economical, and they don't want to overwhelm the, anybody. And so I'm probably not. And all the policemen that portray the Colorado Springs policemen are all actual Knoxville policemen. So when they say, we need to take the building, they say, okay, let's go. <laughs> they belong to a, a group or a business that's called 5 Productions, and their motto is, one take only. And as real as it gets. And as real as it gets. Because <laughs> they're cops, you know, they don't have to teach them anything, you know. They make a felony stop, you bet, you know, felony car stop. There are certain techniques law enforcement uses when approaching members of the public that are unique to law enforcement. And if you don't have a policeman doing it, then you've got to get a policeman to teach an actor how to do it. Well, that's very time consuming and expensive and everything else. So it's just these guys put this whole business together and we paid them to do it. Now we had to teach Carl to teach him how to smoke. And he's almost got it right, but not quite. Yeah. Right. Carl was smarter than me. He never smoked a cigarette in his life until now. We put him in television and make him smoke Hollywood cigarettes. We got made out of vegetable material and then tobacco. Now, our, our director likes to tell everyone that he's been trying to teach him how to smoke for six years. Yeah, that's right. You almost have it, but not quite. Hopefully this season. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't smoke. I quit seven years ago. And she did pretty good. Smoking has always been a reliable path to an early grave, you know? <laughs> well, it was almost a reliable path to an early grave because we both quit on the same day. Yes. <laughs> we did not kill each other. We no. came close, but we didn't kill each other. We both wore ballistic vests. <laughs> we had our neutral corners <laughs> in the house. You know, don't cross the line. Stay over there. You know. Yeah, we always survived. We're still here, you know. Uh, anyway. Thanks, Kathy, for what you just said before. I don't, I don't really have anything planned. I know there's a bunch of third-time cruisers here. We are proud to be there. There's also a bunch of nurses here. All yeah. nurses, raise your hand. <laughs> That, oh, sorry. The fact that this phenomenon has been created is just, you know, amazing. Like, you're amazed by it. When I talk to outside people about you, they're like, what? But the first cruise was like, I'm really going to meet these people? Carl, too? And I just, it's great, and we love you very, very much. Thank well, you. Well, thank you very much. Very much. Thank you to all the nurses. Nurses, you have to be nice to nurses. They keep the doctors from killing you. We have time for two more questions. Two more questions. There's one back. Way back there. Can't hear you. To make a good detective, did you say the best characteristics to make a good detective? Yeah. Yes. Huh? Is that what you said? Yes. There are only a couple things you need to be the world's best detective. You need a knowledge of the law. You have to know what you can do. And more importantly, you have to know what you may not do. And more, what you may not do is more important to know. The only other skill required is to have an undying sense of curiosity. Who did this? How did this happen? Somebody did this. Who are they? It's your job to find them. It's not 48 hours. It's, not, it's whatever it takes. It's whatever it takes, however long it takes. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. If you get that in your head, this is going to be a long road. And then even after the arrest is made, it gets longer after that. 
And now I get two years in court? Answer the question? I got one last question over here. Okay, so I know that you mentioned that, well, actually, we saw on the show that there was one time that you did get shot. Shot at, not shot. shot. shot at. Okay, no. I thought you were, okay. No. Okay, I apologize. No. For some reason, I thought you got shot. I was going to say, how did you deal with that story? Well, I'll, I'll tell you one story, and it doesn't relate to that particular one, but he was on patrol, and he <laughs> got shot at, and they thought he had, and, uh, so by the time he got all the paperwork done, it was like, I don't know, 8 o'clock in the morning. He comes in, and he was supposed to be home at 11 o'clock at night. And I thought, okay, you know, have him called. So he comes home at 8 o'clock in the morning. My son is very little. Remember when they used to have those battery-powered Tommy guns? And he walked in the door, and my son comes around the corner. <laughs>